Um, so, hi everyone. Um, today, uh, this is uh, our OPR interview, Oxford Political Interview, with um, Professor Ruth Chang from the Faculty of Law in the University of Oxford. Um, today, we'll talk about um, her latest research, um, some of her views on um, normativity, uh, on jurisprudence, um, and a wide range of other topics. Um, and so, today, um, to kick off the interview, uh, my first question here is, um, how do you get into jurisprudence um, and specifically, you know, your field, practical reason and normativity um, and just decision making in the first place? Because um, I assume that's something, you know, not something that most law students think of doing when they start law school. Right. Why take a huge pay cut and live impoverished, right, <laughs> when you got all this <laughs> earning capacity after law school? Uh, so in my case, going to law school was a hiatus from philosophy. So I, I fell in love with philosophy. Um, I quite frankly didn't have the courage to pursue a graduate degree in philosophy. So I did what everyone who doesn't know what to do and is lucky enough applied to law school and went to law school. Um, so really, it's I've just come back to my roots. I'm doing philosophical work that I hope is relevant to the real world and jurisprudence is the perfect place for that. And that's why I've come to Oxford. Hmm. Um, and so, you know, there's so many institutions obviously um, around the world with very good, you know, research, uh, very good law schools and very good research on jurisprudence. Um, what brought you specifically to Oxford and why do you think this is the place to continue your research given that you're from the US and, you know, there's a lot of US law schools that do this as well. Yeah, you know, it's just not true that there are a lot of US law schools who do this as well. By this, I uh, have something very specific in mind. So Oxford is not only extremely beautiful, which is very important to me after spending 20 years in New Jersey, um, but it's got all these resources that are currently, I mean, this is a little bit of an exaggeration, but they're kind of currently siloed, right? You've got this great philosophy department, wonderful political philosophers, great um, you know, legal philosophers, and then there's some social philosophy between all three, and there's, there's not a huge amount of interaction between them. So uh, I think of Oxford as a place where one can take the traditional subject matter of jurisprudence, which is often thought to be you know, roughly philosophy of law, um, and turn use it as a place in which ideas that have a philosophical backbone can be um, mixed with ideas from political philosophy and legal philosophy so that we can focus on issues that are important right, for the world. So I'm interested in bringing philosophy to the real world, but in a rigorous way with a rigorous philosophical backbone and not just applied philosophy, but you know, certain questions of, of intrinsic interest also have you know, tentacles that reach into the future about how you think about a problem. So I think Oxford is the best place for that. Mm -hmm. um, and it really helps that Oxford has that history there, right? Um, and all the traditions, I assume. The, his, the history of these various traditions is one of excellence and, you know, kind of probing. Um, I wouldn't say Oxford has been, has a history of being super open to yeah. other disciplines. I think recently Oxford philosophy certainly has reached out and tried to, you know, bring philosoph philosophical ideas to the world in a very impressive way. And I think they've succeeded. So in a way, I'm trying to build on that um, uh, and try to bring some of the legal philosophers mm -hmm. and political theorists into the conversation with the philosophers. So one of the things I've done is um, I've created a, a new graduate course called Philosophy, Law, and Politics. Mm -hmm. And the point of the course is to get our brilliant graduate students from all three faculties into a room talking about an issue that's relevant to them. Yep. And by an issue, I don't necessarily mean an applied issue like, you know, democracy, what pros and cons, how mm -hmm. should we invigorate it? It can also be extremely philosophical because some issues like, for instance, um, you know, how do we think about decision-making? That's relevant uh, uh, 
uh, across all fields. And it's a kind of fundamental element in real world thinking. We got to understand that better. And of course, that's kind of where I've gone. My interests are in practical reason, value, decision making, how to think about um, our place as normative creatures in the world mm -hmm. through what we do as agents. Um, and so as um, the head of the Faculty of Law here in Oxford, what has been your, I guess, most rewarding experience? Um, and what do you really like the most about, um, about the job? So first correction, I am not the head of, faculty, of the Faculty of Law, the Dean. Yeah. Uh, Mindy Chen Wishart, who's been a oh. fabulous dean, is the head of the law faculty. Thank God she's got that job instead of me. Um, what I like about this job is the freedom to try to create something, you know, the freedom to try to move the subject matter of jurisprudence in a direction that I think, and you know, I could be wrong, but I mm -hmm. think will be fruitful and good for it and good for um, neighboring fields as well. And you can't really do that at an American law school. You're sort of stuck in existing structures, mm -hmm. but the statutory professors at Oxford, I mean, they're really sui generis jobs mm -hmm. uh, um, because they really do give you a lot of freedom to try to create things. And that's what I love most. Mm -hmm. um, and so just kind of moving on to a more academic discussion here. Um, and we can start with really the big, you know, million dollar question in, in, in jurisprudence. And that is um, and, and very a very pertinent uh, subject because it's at, it kind of speaks up to the heart of a lot of our social problems. And, and that is, what do you think justice is roughly? And it's a very broad question, but in, in your yeah. <laughs> conception, yeah. yeah. Yeah, you might as well have asked me, so what substance? You know, yeah. I was told that David Wiggins used to ask, uh, you know, the high schoolers who would be interviewed for undergraduate entry into Oxford that question. Uh, people spend their whole lives on this question. So I, I'm not going to say what I think justice is. I can give you um, my own gloss at a very high level. Mm -hmm as to what I think is the right framework for thinking about justice. Yeah. I think of justice as, um, you know, it's the normative product of the correct application mm -hmm. of thinking about how to live together to, you know, various specific questions. Mm -hmm. It's the upshot of that. So you'll notice that the way I framed it puts practical reason right at the core yeah. of understanding what justice is. So I don't think you can, I mean, this is going to be a kind of very purple claim, but I don't think you can really understand justice deeply without understanding first uh, how to think about how to live. Mm -hmm. right, practical reason is at the very core um, of the high level values that we care about like justice, equality, and so on. Mm -hmm. um, and so, I mean, talking about your specific research um, right now, can you explain your theory on, on parity and or this idea that, you know, items are on par with each other in a hard case? Um, because when I first encountered this, um, I was just thinking in, for example, in arbitration, where sometimes, you know, something very definitive is required. Uh, how do you reconcile that with your principle? And and and, and does it show that uh, this uh, trichotomy is still really a dominant assumption here? Right. Okay. So, um, parity, the nugget of the idea has to do with something that seems a little abstract, but mm -hmm. I hope I can explain it in a way that shows how fundamental it is. Mm -hmm. So if we think about, you know, there's the world of what there is and there's the world of what ought to be, and there are questions about how they're related and so on. Okay, but on the on the surface, there's there are questions about, you know, what ought to be done, how should I live, etc. And value is one of the tools we use to answer those kinds of questions. Mm -hmm. Reasons are another. So parity applies to both thinking about value and thinking about reasons. 
but I'm going to, let me just put the point in terms of value because I think it's easier to understand. You know, take any value, beauty, justice, um, kindness. Uh, here's a, a deep assumption we make about the value. Values are what I call trichotomous in structure. That's what we're taught, you know, on our mother's knee pretty much, and mm -hmm. certainly in higher education. And by that, I just mean, if you take any value like beauty, and you got two things. If you try to relate them with respect to beauty, there are only three possibilities. The one is more beautiful, less mm. beautiful, or they're equally that, uh, beautiful. And that's all you've got. And that underlying assumption about the domain of value infiltrates standard ways that... Um, you know, we have developed decision theories, social choice theories, and so on. We just assume that whenever you've got anything normative, there are only three possibilities, better, worse, equal. Right? And if none of those three possibilities holds, then we throw up our arms and we say, well, the items can't be compared. I think that that fundamental assumption is mistaken and that hard choices, the very intuitive idea of hard choices gives us a window into seeing that the structure of value isn't trichotomous, but it's tetrichotomous, right? There are actually four basic ways two things can relate normatively. One can be better, it can be worse, it can be equal, but they can also be on a par. So parity uh, represents cases in which you've got two items that are evaluatively, qualitatively very different with respect to whatever matters in the comparison between them. And yet they're in the same neighborhood of value. And you know these are uh, common terms, but there's a technical idea behind you know, what it is to be in the same neighborhood of value, um, you know, uh, what it is to be qualitatively different, but they that can be cashed out in simple ways. Right? Just just think of some examples. Uh, you know, if you're choosing between two really different careers, you can be a ski instructor, you can be an accountant. Well, what matters in the choice between the two careers will be a bunch of stuff. And with respect to that bunch of stuff, one career will be better in some ways, the other will be better in other ways. And yet it won't seem that one is better than the other. They're qualitatively very different, but they're in the same neighborhood of all the stuff that matters in the choice between them. That's a case where neither career is better than the other. They're not equally good. They're on a par. And when you have parity, something else comes in which is very significant, right? That is the way you respond rashly in the case of parity is very different from how we respond if trichotomy were true, right? So, so if we think, you know, let's go back to our example of beauty, you've got these two things, or no, no let's, let's use policies of justice, right? So think of lady justice with her balance scale, right? Only three possibilities. The scales are evenly balanced. It goes up, it goes down. Okay. So if you've got these two policies and you're trying to evaluate them, compare them with respect to justice, uh, you might have two policies that are qualitatively very different, but in the same neighborhood of the value of justice, they're on a par. It's a hard choice. Now what? Well, in the old days, the sorry, we're still in the old days, but in the old paradigm, right? Because you've got lady justice, there are only these three possibilities of the scales. And what you ought to do is dictated by the way the values or the reasons, you know, relate to one another. So, right, if the balance is like this, then let's assume weight is a good thing. Uh, uh, then that's the policy that's more just than this one. Right? If it's like this, then, oh no, you better choose that policy, not this one. If they're evenly balanced, ah, flip a coin between them. All right, so that picture of rational agency of the proper response to the way the values in the world relate 
makes no room for agency itself, right? Where, where are you in this picture, right? You could just be a, a, an AI machine who's seeing how the values in the world hang out. And then you've got a program, right? If it goes like this, she said, it goes like that, she said, boom, flip a coin, right? Okay, so the investigation of hard choices does two things, two, I think, very important things. One is it gives us um, a new way of thinking about how value itself might be structured, that our basic assumption that something's gotta be better, worse, or equal to another, which very naturally comes from the trichotomous structure of the non-evaluative world, right? So if you've got two sticks, one's gotta be longer, less long, or they have to be equally long. Right? We just assume that that structure for the length of sticks works for choices between careers, people to marry, and the normative stuff. And I think that's a mistake. And hard choices allow us to see that it's a mistake. There are actually these four basic ways things can be related. So that's the first thing. New structure for thinking about the normative uh, reality, reality, if you like. Okay. But the second thing is, you know, if you have a trichotomous view of the structure of value, then rational agency or correct appropriate agency, whatever you want to call it, is always dictated to you by the way the world is. That is how the values or the reasons weigh up against one another. And that's not the right picture, I think, of human rational agency. We actually have some capacity to create, I know it sounds pretty radical, create reasons or values for ourselves. And the clearest case, I think, in which we can do this are hard choices. So if you've got the two careers, you've got the skiing career and the accounting career, they're qualitatively very different in the same neighborhood of value. It's a hard choice, they're on a par. It's not like Lady Justice with her balance scale, where the way her balance uh, you know, works out tells you what to do. Now you've got this capacity, if you've got a hard choice, to actually commit, so I say, commit to an evaluative feature of, I don't know, the ski instructor career, right? You can commit to having a life out on the slopes with fresh air and the values of being one with nature and so on, and thereby endow that alternative with value it didn't have before. What you're, what you're doing is by committing to something, by putting yourself behind something, you're giving yourself an extra reason, what I call the will-based reason, to go for that option that you didn't have before. And when you do that, when you commit to something, right, you actually change something about yourself. Right? You constitute your rational identity, your best rational self in the following way. Before, before you did anything, before you created a reason for yourself or added value to one of the careers, here's the truth in the world. Yeah. The careers are on a par. So that's something true about you. Choosing between these two careers, it's choosing between two things that are on a par. Now there's something you can do. You can stand behind one of the options, commit to it, value to the ski instructing career. And now, hey, presto, you've done something absolutely extraordinary. You've made it true for yourself that the skiing career is better for you than the accounting career. And that makes that that makes something true about you, that the skiing is better than accounting for you. And in this way, you've changed the reasons that obtain for you. And you know, someone else faced with a choice between skiing and accounting might put herself behind um, the financial security of an accounting career. And she makes herself into the kind of person for whom accounting is better than skiing. I think it's in this way that we can have some agential, 
right, quite significant agential input mm. into the reasons we have to live one kind of life as opposed to another. Right. So, so again, the, the two main things is we're changing the very right where our our understanding, the very structure of value. Uh, and you know, when I get overly excited by this, I try to analogize it with, you know, we have intuitive ideas about space and time. Guess what? Our intuitive ideas are mistaken, right? So Einstein taught us that space and time are more connected than we thought. Here's an assumption we have about the normative world. It's trichotomous in structure. And it, that assumption permeates almost everything we do in the normative world. That assumption is mistaken. Right? We actually have four basic ways normative things can relate. And then the second thing is don't think that all the reasons and values you have in your life are given to you by the way the world is. Right? You actually get to create some reasons for yourself mm -hmm. under the appropriate constraints. Um, uh, and you know the easiest way to see this is in hard cases and make it true that in a hard case, you have most reason to do one thing as opposed to another. And so that's a radical view of rationality and what it is to be a rational agent. It's not to sit back and calculate the reasons that are given to you in the world and figure out you know, which reasons are heavier than others or whether they're equally balanced. That's mm -hmm. not our job as rational agents. Our job is that, but more significantly, it is to craft a justifiable um, way through lots of different possible paths of life that we can take through our commitments. Um, so you use the example of having different careers um, to illustrate your point. Listening to what you were saying, I was just thinking, so for example, it's very easy to say, um, you as an individual um, comparing a career in performing arts um, versus a career in engineering um, seems like apple and oranges, but they can be on par and you can give value. So if, for example, if you're into um, sculpture, you can want to develop a career in that you can instill value into that for yourself. Um, but if I'm just thinking in a hypothetical scenario where you are comparing a career between say chemical engineering and counting grass. Would you say that in this situation that you as a person can put a lot of value into counting grass and that is a valuable thing, um, but how does that reconcile with how society operates? Okay, so now you're asking for details. So we're gonna get in the weeds a little bit of yeah. the theory, but I think I can say it quickly. Okay. So the theory says um, there are constraints mm -hmm. on the reasons you can create. Yeah. So if in fact, right, the given, what I call the given reasons, the reasons that are grounded in the way the world is, mm -hmm. right, which the way the world is includes stuff like what you like, your desires, your preferences, and so on. Um, if those given reasons give you the following truth, which is this option is way better than this option, right, or better, okay? Mm -hmm. If it gives you what I call a valence, then the will, the reasons you can create can never change the valence, mm -hmm. right? So you might think that, oh, well, that seems rather ad hoc, how come? Well, the picture is that, you know, the world offers us a kind of fence, right? Here's, here's a boundary, uh, you know, murder and torture and so on. That's beyond the boundary. Don't go there. But within the boundary, within the fence, we actually have the freedom to create reasons for ourselves to make it true that what's best for us is um, doing one thing as opposed to another. Mm -hmm. right? So if you look at the given reasons and facts about us and so on, it's pretty clear that a lifetime spending counting blades of grass is worse than an accounting career, 
Mm -hmm. right? So that's a case where you have a valence. Now, it's still true, right? Because my, this is the new paradigm of rationality. The new paradigm of rationality says, look, you've got this capacity, you've got this normative power to create reasons, to put your will behind something and add normativity to it, which it didn't have before. Mm -hmm. So you might be the sort of person who, you know, commits to, stands behind counting blades of grass or figuring out how many blades of grass there are in this patch, right? Mm -hmm. And so here's something you can do. You can actually endow a career of grass counting with value it didn't have before, right? For yourself, but you can never change the valence, right? Grass counting is worse than, you know, lawyering, doctoring, mm -hmm accounting, et cetera. Now, what this shows is that by committing to something, even though you can't change the valence of the given reasons, you can actually do something which we think is intuitively plausible. Mm -hmm. You can change the difference in normativity between two options. So here's an example that's like the grass counting one. Um, this is, you know, of the thousands of letters I've received from people, this is actually a real case. So here you are, you're a woman in an abusive relationship. Mm -hmm. And here's what's true with respect to the reasons given to you by the world. It's better to leave your abusive spouse. Right? Staying is worse and leaving so it's got a valence but now compare and it's usually a woman so i'm going to say a woman compare the woman who confronts this fact and then oh yeah you know i should leave my spouse with the woman who actually commits to a life with her abuser she she puts she stands behind having a life with this abusive person. Mm -hmm. So by committing to staying, she actually adds value to staying. She can't add value to make it now best for her to mm -hmm. stay. But think about the difference in the value of staying and leaving for the woman who commits right, to having a life with this person and the woman who doesn't, the difference is smaller, mm -hmm. right? And that just fits with what we think. What's important is that you can't change the valence, right? And there's a bunch of arguments as to why that would be, but the intuitive idea is the one I started with, mm -hmm. which is if you have reasons that are given to you by the way the world is, um, you know, they, they're like a fence. And so there's a valence here. That's like a fence. You can't run into it. I mean, when I think about here I am, there's this wall. I can commit to walking through this wall, but the world stops me, right? It doesn't allow me to commit and make it true that I can walk through the wall. And the same is true of given reasons, the kind of standard externalist and internalist reasons that philosophers talk about. Um, so I'm just following your thinking here. Just a quick question here. When you said the world sort of acts like a fence around the space for you to act um, where you can exercise your will, does law, do you think law is that fence? Law is one feature of the world. Um, social structures are another feature. I mean, just, you know, the stuff that's in the world that we all agree is in the world. Those things often, not always, but often provide reasons for us not to do this, to do that, etc. Those are all the kind of given reasons that um, provide a fence inside of which we then have the freedom to 
carve our own justified path through life. Hmm. Um, and so just thinking about this whole theory, I'm just curious, is this influenced by, say, Nietzsche and his ideas about having a lot of agency and how, having a lot of you know, will to the individual? Um, not really. Um, so I confess as an undergraduate, I never read Nietzsche. <laughs> um, but uh, will to power is not really what I'm talking about here. I'm talking about, I mean, if we, you know, here's the philosophical idea. If we ask in virtue of what is something a reason to do something, like we're asking, as the metaphysicians say, what's the ground of the normativity of the reason? Why is this fact, right, which is usually just an inert natural fact, um, like the fact that my blood pressure is high? Uh, if my blood pressure is high, that's a natural fact. How does that natural fact get this action guiding force to it? Right, because you know there are a bunch of other natural facts, and they don't seem to be action guiding. So, if we're asking for the ground of something's being a reason, we've got these two standard answers that have been going on, actually, since Confucius, maybe even further. It's either because, right, the answer of why something is a reason. It's either because there's some value right, or some basic normative fact that this is a reason for that. So Derek Parfit is very famous for saying, look, the fact that it's agony just is a reason for you to want to avoid it. That's just a ground level fact. It's a normative fact. Mm -hmm. And so if you ask, well, why is the fact that it's agony a reason for you to want to avoid it? It just is. And then there are different versions of that saying, well, you know, it's a reason because it will achieve some value, but you get some kind of normative grounding mm -hmm. for something's being a reason. The other standard response, um, you know, Hume probably most famously mm -hmm. uh, um, uh, defending is the idea that something is a reason in virtue of some relation between that reason, the action that's a reason for, and stuff that you want, right? your desires, your goals, et cetera. So um, why is the fact that my blood pressure is high a reason for me to start to exercise? Oh, because some desire I have, I want to live long or I want to be healthy. And the value-based view would say, oh, no, it's because it's good for you to live a healthy life. Mm -hmm. Those are the two standard ways of answering this very deep question, roughly, where do reasons come from? Mm -hmm. And so the parody view, right, the idea that you can create reasons says, that's not it. There's a third possible explanation of where our reasons and values come from, they can come from us, right? Mm -hmm. Us as such. Here's this thing that we can do with our wills, or by will, I don't mean anything fancy. I just mean us. Mm -hmm. We can stand behind something. We can commit to a path, and that can endow something with normativity, uh, or more fancifully, create a new, not value-based, not desire-based, but will-based reason to pursue that path. Mm -hmm. um, so if we move on to something slightly more political, and essentially we're talking about political implications of some of these theories. Now, some people would argue that Western normativity is based on Judeo-Christian values. Some of the things that guide us, telling us what we should or should not do is based on Judeo-Christian values. Um, but religion is, in many countries, playing a smaller part um, in how we think and how society think these days, especially with the younger population. Um, do you think that 
we increasingly live in a quote unquote normativity less world um, or, or some might say a godless world? Um, and does that disrupt or even destroy our sense of morality? Um, so I think godlessness does not by itself do anything to destroy morality uh, because to think that right and wrong depend on a transcendent being is just a mistake. Okay. I mean, you can get facts like it's just wrong to impose agony on a newborn infant for your own amusement without there being a transcendent supernatural being. Okay. Uh, I think maybe what you're asking, I mean, there is something that I, I do think is happening um, in today's world, which has to do with, well, here are two things, two thoughts. One is, I think a lot of people still make what philosophers call the genetic fallacy. So if you take um, a moral claim, take a, take a moral belief. Uh, maybe you believe that abortion is permissible. The way the bad argument goes is, I can give you a causal origin story as to why you have that belief. Right, evolution, social conventions, uh, religious doctrine, I guess, sorry, that would go the other way, but uh, you see what I mean. Uh, so if I can give you a causal explanation of why you have a normative belief that doesn't necessarily appeal to some sui generis normative fact, mm -hmm. right, then we've debunked the belief. Right? So I just heard a I mean, David Kennedy just gave a talk here at the New Institute where I am in Hamburg. And, you know, the critical legal studies line is, if you look at law, all it is is just an expression of the power structures that ex exist in society. Uh, but, you know, by giving a sociological explanation of how law came to be, that doesn't involve any normative claims about, you know, this is the law is representing what's right or something like that. That doesn't, you don't want to say that that debunks the content of the law. Mm -hmm. So you don't want to say that a causal story about the origins, right? The genetic origins of an idea debunks the content of the idea. So that's one kind of threat that I keep seeing over and over. Uh, that I think may be chipping away at morality, but it's it's mistaken, right? Um, I guess another threat to morality is psychological. So, you know, law, uh, you might think, and Joseph Raz did, mm. you know, the point of law is to kind of take away your own practical reasoning about what to do and to make it pretty easy you got the shortcut the law says stop at red lights so i not, i don't have to contemplate the reasons for and against stopping at red lights in various circumstances the law just tells me what to do and the law is justified Raj thinks because it's better at getting you to conform to what you have most reason to do than you are if you thought about each case um, ab initio. So you might say that social features like law, um, you know, make us detached from the actual reasons we have to do this and that. Uh, here's a better example, maybe, you know, soldiers, you got to follow orders. The orders say, drop a bomb on the village. Mm -hmm. So you don't, you become 
less attached to the moral reasons against doing that. So in our rule-bound culture, and what I'm most nervous about is, uh, you know, what's coming down the pike, which are, as Lorraine Dasson put it, thin rules of artificial intelligence like governing human life, psychologically, we may feel more distant um, from the reasons that we have to behave what we would now say is the morally correct way. Like if we become a rule-bound culture and laws and instance of that, uh, that to me is very dangerous. Um, so I'm just thinking, um, in terms of the other thing you talked about, which is, um, us as rational agents and kind of instilling values into, um, our, our decisions, our choices, because we are rational. I recently interviewed, um, Kate Raworth, who's the economist behind Donut Economics. Um, and in our interview, we discussed how maybe we should discard this notion that we as humans are you know, purely individualistic or purely rational agents, um, or that we're purely making ration, rationality-based decisions. Um, and that has become some sort of a foundation for not a lot of neoliberal economic thinking. Um, and perhaps we should think our, of ourselves as emotional beings and we're a member of a community, sort of like a communitarian point of view. Um, and so I'm just wondering, um, what do you think of this? And um, do you think it, it, your theory or your thinking um, can reconcile with this communitarian um, logic? Yeah, okay. So I love what's happening in the academy right now, which is there's a kind of general groundswell of academics that are rejecting the old models. GDP, that's not a good measure of the well-being of people in a nation. We got to add a bunch of other stuff. Right? Um, uh, donut economy, that's very much like other um, new paradigms of how we should be measuring the flourishing of a nation state or indeed the global economy. So Dennis Snower, who is president of the Global Solutions Initiative that is kind of hooked in with the G7, the G20. So he's got this, uh, a, another kind of dashboard, mm -hmm. which he calls SAGE. And so there are four things we got to have before a nation state mm -hmm. can be count, counted as flourishing. You need solidarity. Yeah. A, you need agency. G, you need material gain. That's the GDP stuff. And E, you need environment, right? Mm -hmm. And those four things, in a way, maybe one would have to argue about this, encapsulate some of the stuff about the donut uh, economy. But um, so people are moving to different measures of flourishing that are less homo economicus based, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Understanding that we're more complex than that. And you know, not to knock the old models because you know you got to start with over precision and, and false assumptions to try to get models going. That's the easiest way to model something, and then you complexify. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think the heart of your question is really this idea between you know focusing on the individual as a rational agent, and you know there's a there's a cluster of other ideas, but roughly we can say. Uh, you know, don't focus on the individual as a decision maker. Think of a community or a group. Um, uh, and, you know, maybe you don't even think about the rationality of the community group. Maybe it's sort of, I don't know exactly what you meant, but it's an emotive or emotions or somehow involved. Okay, so this actually gets to, uh, I think, kind of really important point. I think people who care about or focus on groups as the right unit by which to spin a theory or to understand something 
are totally correct and you know that's fine that's all good mm -hmm. but they do this other thing which is they diss the people who focus on individual rationality and i think that's a mistake for the following reason insofar as we individuals contribute to whatever the right unit is of a group as agents right not merely as sources of emotion but as rational agents we contribute to a decision of the group then you got to understand what's happening at the individual level so there's an argument here that even if we should be thinking in, in a general economic theory say about some small groups maybe functionally defined mm -hmm. as the element by which we you know, move pieces around and assess the flourishing of an economy, that can't really be properly understood unless you understand what's the correct kind of contribution that an individual makes to that whole. Mm -hmm. Okay, so here's a kind of simple example like suppose you're a parent and a family and you've been offered a new job in a new country you got to think oh should i take the job and if you're the wrong kind of uh individualist rationalist thinker mm -hmm. you'll say oh okay i got to think about you know how much money i'll make and blah, blah. that's wrong but that's not to say that focusing on individual rationality is wrong. It's to say that you got to focus on individual rationality correctly. You've got to include all the stuff that matters when the individual makes this decision. How will it affect my family? Will my kids get to go to a better school um, and have better prospects in life? Um, how will it affect the community? And you might even think what matters is what's my carbon footprint if I move to this? Or how does my action affect, you know, the farmers in Argentina who mm -hmm. sell beef? Like, that's not to say that the focus on the individual is a mistake it's to point out that you better when you focus on the individual understand correctly all the elements which will often be social and group implying right all the elements that are relevant to what's going on in the individual's choice making or thinking uh, as a contributor to a group Right, the way you put it was sort of, oh, well, you know, if individuals contribute to a group simply by being these kind of emotional instruments, then the agency of the individual isn't involved. And then I would say, well, that doesn't seem like a very good theory to me. Mm -hmm. But insofar as anyone who says we must focus on groups, uh, you know, whatever they might mean by that, insofar as they also think that individuals in the group contribute to the group decision or the group agency through their own agency, you got to understand individual agency, right? That's the first port of call. Um, so just following your logic here again, um, I'm very curious about what your view on, say, if we, when we tackle social problems, start with this assumption that we start as a group, we start as a, for example, a community or a race, and say certain individuals in that community, say it's a racial group or a class or socioeconomic class, certain individuals in that class or group um, have very contradictory um, thoughts or making contradictory decisions from the interests of the greater community or group. Um, and that is perhaps something that shouldn't be encouraged because it is a selfish act and you're compromising the greater cause of your community. Um, and so do you think that, I mean, first of all, what are your thoughts on that? Um, and, and do you think that it has become potentially a problem 
in, in, in today's society. Right, so I think you're pointing to the problem that I was trying to address, which is if you, um, suppose you wanna fix a problem for a particular group that might be labeled in some socioeconomic way, okay? And um, members of that group are trying to do something to improve their condition. Now you can always have individuals who are members of a group who are taking the wrong things into account when they're making decisions as a contributory component to the group decision. Mm -hmm. right, so they're gonna vote for their own interests. They're not thinking about what's best for the group. And that's a normative debate about, look, you know, you're a selfish bastard. You need to include interests of others mm -hmm. when you're voting on behalf of what the group should do. And that's just a normative mistake that those people are making. But mm -hmm. that's not to say that it's a mistake to understand what individuals are doing when they are contributing to a group decision. I, uh, now you said, you asked whether you think, whether I think this is a problem. Yes, what do you think? Do you think that this has become a, a, a problem in today's society if, um, say a lot of things um, is group oriented instead of individual oriented? Um, can you give me an example of what you have in mind? Because on the face of it, I can't see any problem per se with groups acting in a political theater mm -hmm. as opposed to individuals. I mean, that's the, to me seems to be a probably good thing, mm -hmm. but you know, it depends on the substance of what they're advocating for. Yeah. So what so, do you have in mind? So, I, so I was just thinking, um, in, when we're interacting, as individuals, perhaps in today's political climate, it's easy to recognize someone or interact with someone um, based on what group they belong to. So for example, instead of communicating with you as individual to individual, I am communicating to you thinking first and foremost about which group that you belong to. Um, and 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 kind of having a perception of you um, based on the group that you belong to. Um, and so, you know, we can talk about this as a, a form of sub, you know subconscious bias, maybe. But that is this idea of understanding you not as an individual, not as yourself, but as you are a member of this group. Therefore, A, a B, C, D. These are your preferences. And these yeah. are the these decisions you're going to make. Yeah, you think yeah. that has become a problem in today's society that we seem to not interact as individual to individual anymore, and we don't we care less about what this individual's preferences are and care about what group they belong to first, and then perceive them through that lens. Yeah. Okay, that's a interesting and great question. Um, I think the first thing to say is that psychologists have pretty much established, maybe that's too strong, but they have proposed and there's data that supports them that the way the human mind works is in terms of categories. So we've got these schema, schemata, I guess it's the plural. Um, and we move through the world quickly classifying things according to these schemata. Mm -hmm. uh, that's just how the mind works. Okay. Now, there's this other <laughs> layer on that, which is, you know, dog, chair, table, that's okay, but um, woman, trans woman, you know, uh, black person, mm -hmm. we might ask normatively whether those are useful categories, um, useful in the sense of conducing to uh, the best way we might live together. And I guess my own view, I think you're probably right in suggesting that um, in today's polarized, polarized society where sectarianism just runs rampant, that there is more and more of this 
quick taxonomizing, categorizing people according to, you, you know, usually superficial features and then making assumptions about their character or their preferences on the basis of stereotypes for that group that probably is happening. Now you say that you suggested that that's happening. I mean, I guess I'm, I'm curious about, you know, the question of why is that happening? And my own view completely shooting from the hip because I don't, I'm not a scientist in this area is that it has to do with the, I'll just call it the perpetrators own vulnerabilities and insecurities, right? That we have moved into a polarized sectarian, quick to schematize and categorize way of interacting with one another because of our own vulnerabilities that we feel threatened. I mean, if you engage in the fanciful thought experiment, suppose we were all in a land of milk and honey mm -hmm. right, where everyone felt secure, right? there was no precarity. Would we act this way? Probably, but not as bad, right? It wouldn't be as, as awful. Um, and maybe less would turn on it. Mm -hmm. uh, but I don't really know. I think that, you know, this is one of the big topics that I hope people in your generation will start to think about it and write about. Um, and then finally, um, I just want to ask you, uh, what is the project that you're currently working on? And do you mind just giving our readers a tease of what to expect next from you? Publication wise or just projects you're, you're, you're doing? Okay, well, um, one of the things I'm working on now has to do with trying to, I mean, this is a big, like I'm trying, trying to get going a design for artificial intelligence that doesn't assume trichotomy. And so the next big revolution is technology. Uh, and right now we're building into technology the absence of hard choices, right? In the sense that I'm interested in. And yet hard choices are, in my view, right at the heart of the human condition, right? This is, hard choices are the place where we get to do stuff. We get to actually exercise our agency in very significant ways. And if we start building AI or machines in general that assume that we don't have hard choices, that everything's trichotomously given and the machine just has to figure out which pan goes down and whether they're evenly balanced. Um, I feel very nervous about the value alignment problem right? because machines are going to be saying, this is better than that, when in fact, the truth is it's a hard choice. So unless we put hard choices into the very design of machines, uh, I think value alignment is hopeless. So if we put, if we read, if we create a protocol for the design of machines that makes room for parity, then what we're doing is we're guaranteeing that the human can be in the loop in, mm -hmm. in just the right place, right? Whenever the machine faces a hard choice. Mm -hmm. And that's a way of halting some of the more, uh, you know, scary scenarios of the proliferation of AI. Mm -hmm. um, incredibly interesting. And this is very timely as well, given that all the discussion on chat GBT um, and, and, and how should we should use it, um, it's been kind of dominant, um, topic right now um anyways that is the end of um my questions and and hence the interview um but thank you so much obviously this is a very very um in um enlightening educational experience um for me and hopefully for for our readers and our viewers as well um it's it's an abstract topic um but this, 
the way you illustrated um, these points and gave examples has been very, very um, helpful and, and, and explanatory, um, to say the least. Can I just say one thing yeah. about you know application? So this this set of abstract ideas really has to do with how to move through the world. Like there's nothing more concrete and real than that. Yeah. The ideas are abstract, but what they're what they point to is, you know, stop moving through the world as if you must figure out what the right answer is always, um, in which case you're going to be paralyzed by hard choices. Instead, recognize that life is full of these hard choices, and you actually have this normative power to commit to things and make something that's best for yourself. Mm -hmm. Um. Uh, amazing um that is um that is a very good um idea or the very good thought to kind of end um the, the interview on um and so anyways thank you thank you so much for your time today um thank you jason and, yeah truly inspirational truly educational um and and with that that's the conclusion of the interview all right yeah take care um,